Martin Amos's career took off at the age of 23 with the publication of his first novel, The Rachel Papers. Over the next three decades, he went on to establish himself as one of the most talented writers of his generation and as a distinctive voice of the London literary scene. Now, at the age of 50, he has written his memoir. Entitled Experience, the book examines a life in progress. In it, he considers such subjects as fatherhood and friendship and death and love and literature. The New York Times calls the book a remarkable new memoir and a fulfillment of Amos's own abundant talents as a writer. He has been a frequent guest on this program, and I am always pleased to have him back. Welcome. Great to have you here. Nice to be as back. As I said, you should sit down. We have talked biographically with you. We have, yeah. Almost every visit. We've tended that way, yeah. Because I, I can't resist. I mean, it is my nature to want to know how you shape our life experiences and, and how you are and why you are the way you are. It's, a, it's a, an appealing subject, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, how hard was it for you? You could only do this after the death of your father. Mm. Yeah, it would have been out of the question to, to write about him while he was still around. Um, I don't know why. It's just one of those inhibitions or prohibitions that uh, you instinctively feel. Um, I always, you know, I always knew I would have to write about So your about father's him. death stood between you and this book. Well, that's one way of putting it. Um, it was more like a kind of natural interregnum in my life. Um, I always did know I'd have to write about my father um, because of the uniqueness of our case or near uniqueness. Um, and that seemed to be the time. What's the uniqueness? Father and son, parent and child. Uh, writer and writer. Writer and writer. Uh, remarkably few other examples of him. What of you do you? See, what of him do you see in you? Uh, Let's take talent and put it as an obvious. Um, well, let, let's stick to the credit side of the ledger for the moment. Um, I think uh, dedication. Um, and that's why there aren't many writer, uh, father and son teams, because the talent gets inherited, but the dedication doesn't. Um, Didn't your dad say it about you if he had written an anonymous review, a pseudonymous, if that's a word, written a review using a pseudonym, he would have said something to the effect of about how hard you work? Oh. Well, yes, but he, he, was, he meant that disparagingly. I know he did. He said it. <laughs> he, he meant how hard I worked on the prose. Yeah. And it's, is it old... Meaning it, you had to slug it out to get it. Well, no, that I embellished it too much. Um, oh. Old Dr. Johnson, I think, said of someone that his prose reeks of the lamp. lamp. In other words, he stayed up too late on it and, um, you know, kind of murdered it, curlicued it to death. You think that's an unfair criticism of you? Um... Yeah, oh, just wrong. <laughs> Not unfair, just wrong. No, I, there's, there's definitely something in it. Um, the big difference between him and me is that uh, he was a poet as well. Uh, now, poets, poets slow the world down and freeze it and examine it, and, and each word has to earn its keep, uh, whereas the novel is more sort of free-flowing form. Uh, I'm not a poet. Um, if I get an idea that feels like a poem, then I think it's not a poem, it's a paragraph. Um, so all my stuff has to go into my prose, and it's too much for, for Kingsley's liking, or was. And what's on the debit side? Um, well, the, the brother of dedication is selfishness. Um, and you, you, there's no doubt that that's what you have to be um, if you're really going to get on with this stuff. Uh, and I certainly, I certainly feel a kind of hardness in me sometimes of, you know, when I could be going down to play with my daughters or uh, chat to my sons, uh, I think, no, I'll stay up and do another half hour. Uh, and I, I, say, I say to myself out loud, you've got to be ruthless. Um, you know, and that's, that, go, that goes with the job. And my impression is you look at that, those decisions to be ruthless, and say, it's true. I don't want to change it. It is me. It may not be everybody's cup of tea, but it's where I am. Yeah, that's right. And what and I want. I know it's mysterious, but um, 
you know, you do feel on a on a good day, you do feel that you were sent down here with a with a job of work to do, um, and that you know the hottest section of, of of hell is reserved for those who who have ability and don't don't come up with it, you know, who betray their talent. So uh, you know, I'm afraid in a quite high-minded way, uh, you do justify your your ruthlessness. And your dad was how in that way? My dad was, um, he was, I wouldn't say ruthless, I, he, he was a child of the work ethic, of the Methodist chapel. I mean, you know, his parents were lapsed, but they st he still went to the Sunday school and that kind of thing. And the work ethic was uh, violently active in him. And ha had the odd effect as he got older of, um, of making him implacable about anyone who didn't pay their way, buy their round of drinks, get their share of the tab when uh, eating out in restaurants, because it made you unmanly if you didn't pay your way, and that's part of the work ethic. And so he was, he felt, you know, just extremely guilty if he wasn't working. And his letters have just been published, and the book has been whittled down to 1,200 pages uh, of these often brilliant and very literary letters. And the, the constant theme in them is one of reproach for laziness. And he wrote, what, 35 novels and all that. What did you learn about him from those letters? Um, well, I learned that he was politically much more sensible than he let on to me. Because uh, he was always throwing uh, unspeakable opinions my way. For instance, he said, he said that Nelson, Nelson Mandela was a, a murderer and a terrorist. Um, and I said to him that, you know, his views, no, no one in South Africa thinks that, and his views would get him chucked out of a bar called the Kaffir Flogger. Um, the only people who think, as he does, are a couple of hundred year olds called Wiernicht. I mean, more extreme than anything in the South African yeah. and spectrum. It, and but they're, they're not in the letters. So I, it made me think that he was just sort of winding me up. He also thought you were far too left, didn't he? He thought I was too, too left on certain issues, uh, Vietnam War and uh, nuclear weapons particularly, and I was left about Nelson Mandela. Yeah. But what did you learn about your father that you think you didn't know that was a profound revelation in his letters? Uh, oh, I don't know if there is a... I mean, I knew him pretty well, so yeah. uh, it would surprise me if, um, if it had surprised me. Yeah. Um, no, I think when I came to write about him, a certain certain themes surprised me. Um, how, for instance, his, his life was determined by his phobias. Um, you know, he couldn't fly, he couldn't um, go in a lift, or had trouble in lifts, uh, couldn't go on a train by himself. Once caught a cab from Newcastle to London when he found himself without an escort. And, and this did, these little things did determine his life in an odd way. What is fascinating about that is it goes way back when mm. he was wake up in the middle of the night and your mother would bring him to your room. That's right. That was very bonding. He used to get panic attack nightmares, nightmares followed by panic attacks. Um, and my mother would bring him in to see me and I would talk about what I'd done at school and, and it would calm him down because, as my mother said, he couldn't, he can't be frightened in front of you. Um, you call, you felt at his death, what? Um, well, death of, death of father is a, is a many-layered thing. Um, and I, we saw it coming. I mean, he was, he was dying for a good two months. Um, and the suspense was really more of how we'd take it, how the family would take it rather than what Kingsley's destiny was because that was clear enough. Um, well, you feel, you feel much closer to death yourself. Uh, you feel you've lost a part of yourself, a, a part of yourself and, and, and a part of your armor uh, and you're, you're more vulnerable, you're m more naked in the face of death. Um, but you also feel that you're, you're taking your place um, in the evolutionary sense, that you're, you're coming into your own, moving forward in your life. Uh, not very pleasant feeling either. The father, the father stands, you know, protects you from, from having to think about death by his own existence, because 
your turn hasn't come yet. Yeah. You know? His passing suggests that, in the sense, no matter how many years off, that it's put you next in line. So That's right. Speak, oh, in yeah. your own hierarchy. You're, you're in the front, uh, suddenly. You called Saul Bellow who's a very, very as close a, as, to you as well, one can imagine. He's, um, he's really a hero of mine uh, uh, and a mentor as well as a friend. And I, yes, it's interesting because I, I'm usually very reluctant to ring Saul because um, I wanted to get on with what yeah, he's writing. You think taken away from his work. Yeah, and I wanted him to get on with his work so I can read it. Um, but I did sort of on automatic, really, I called him, and he, um, and I said, you know, I said, you'll have to be my father now, and funnily enough, I won't feel entirely fatherless while he's still around. I fell from the trapeze onto the safety net of Saul, and when he dies, I'll fall from the safety net onto the ground, but it's not such a, a big drop. Um, and that is, you know, uh, of immense value to me. I feeling. never you you make this point too, which I have never quite understand d understood. You say that you are his ideal reader, and Christopher Hitchens is your father's ideal reader. Right. Um, <clears throat> what I mean by ideal reader was um, was very much made apparent to me uh, when I read for the third time his novel Ravelstein. Um, and I, what it means is this, it's quite simple, I just, I couldn't imagine anyone getting more out of this book than I was getting. The, the complexity of pleasure that it gave me, um, I would defy anyone to love that book as much as I, I was loving it as I finished it. And that's all I mean. And there's some areas of my dad's stuff that, that I don't respond to, but Christopher Hitchens, funnily enough, seems to seems to follow it all. And it resonates more with him than it does with you. Exactly. I mean, I, I love my father's stuff, but there's some bits that, that don't work for me, and they do work for him. What happened in this relationship with this fellow, Jacoby? Jacobs. Jacobs. Eric Jacobs. Um, well, I, I include an, an appendix on this. You'll notice that there aren't many complaints about the press, um, although there's a hell of a lot to complain about. Um, <laughs> but this did seem to me uh, uh, egregious. Um, he was my father's biographer, and he was around a good deal and was a much valued friend in the last weeks of my father's life, which were difficult weeks, as you can imagine. And Eric was a kind of family insider. He was a family friend, and he did great things like taking my father into hospital at a critical point. Um, then, 72 hours after my father died, I got a call from him saying that he'd kept notes during this period and he, the Sunday Times was interested in publishing them. And I thought they would be dull and anodyne, as the biography is. Uh, and he sent them around and it was, um, it was as if into, you know, into our china shop he had come of little family feelings and uh, sensitivities he had come bullocking in uh, and, and seemed to be suffering from the delusion that uh, it, was a, it was only he who, um, who, had a, who had any feeling for Kingsley, ridiculously. I okay, mean, but what I'm trying to understand, what was the egregious, most egregious sin that he committed? Uh, he contaminated our grief. He assailed us in our grief. You know, it says it in the Bible, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, um, and not assailed with these uh, revelations. Um, he was just morning de deathbed, and deathbed snooping is what it amounted to. Um, and of course when he agreed to withdraw the, the, um, his jottings as he called them, but published them a few months later, and I expected, we had fired him, the family had fired him from editing my father's letters. Right. Not out of revenge, but because we, we never wanted to set eyes on him ever again. And um, so we severed all connection with him. And when he did go public with these jottings, I expected the press to um, be on the f side of the family. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you think that would be appropriate? But in fact, uh, I looked on with fascination as the press kind of 50-50'd its way into the vacuum. 
We have a tradition in England that my father called pernicious neutrality, where opposed views are given equal play. Um, and this, this means that the press is reduced to a kind of elephantine impotence, because it's on the one hand this, on the one hand that, and they can't see a moral issue when it stares them in the face. On some issues, there's no only one side. Yeah, that's right. And outright condemnation from all quarters is, is demanded by the facts. You have not had a quiet life, even though the work that you do comes from a quiet place. You left, you lived in a family, first of all. Well, your father divorced your mother. Yeah, it was a sort of pretty 50-50, that. And it wasn't a loveless marriage, even at that time. Uh, so, but a, a trauma for the children, sure. Yeah. Then she remarried. Yeah. And the last 15 years of your father's life came back. She, yes, it was a kind of... With her husband. With her third husband. Right. It's if the, you know, the wedge fits. Um, you know, he, he was pho phobic about being alone. He needed family or trusted friends around him all the time. And my mother and stepfather had no money and couldn't afford to live in London, etc. So my brother and I engineered this ménage à toi, uh, completely chased, of course, between right, 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 my father and mother. Uh, and we thought we had a very sticky start at the first dinner when we tried to sort of hammer this out. <laughs> yes. uh, and my brother and I thought, well... And who's making the rules? <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, it was weird, but my brother and I thought um, this might last for six months if we're lucky. Fifteen years. Fifteen years. And... Um, and made his life better. Oh, yes, and gave him back. You know, he, he went into a real misogynistic trough uh, when his second wife left him, the novelist Elizabeth Jane Howard. And I thought he was finished art artistically because... Um, you know, he seemed, a, a writer has to be both a man and a woman, and Kingsley had dismissed the, the feminine side of, not, of, of the world and of his own nature. Uh, tremendously limiting for an artist, that. Um, and I thought he was done for. I was in despair. Um, but when my mother came back into his life, she reminded him of, of the primary value, uh, what he always maintained was the primary value, which was love. And although he never had and never had another woman, never had another relationship um, in the last 15 years of his life, he did write those novels, um, he, and he wrote his greatest novel, The Old Devils. When he was 65, five? seven. Uh, I find that just remarkable. Yes. Uh, and much to be applauded. Yeah. Although I think there's going to be a great run of, uh, you know, n the novel has to catch up with medical science now. If we went through the great classics of, uh, of literature, you'd be astonished by how young the writers were when they were, you know, War and Peace, 35. Uh, I, I wouldn't be astonished at all. I think that I would find that to be probably true, that most of the best works were written <coughs> when people were young. Pride and Prejudice, 19. Um, 19? Yeah. Um, the bulk of it was written when she was 19. But um, now we have, you know, Ravel, Ravelstein, written by... 84-year-old. Right. So how old is he? Um, he's 84, yeah. 85 any day now. Um, the, 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 the span will increase. And, and, and how good do you think it is? Ravelstein, yeah. absolutely wonderful. As you just said, it, it brought you exhilaration and joy and, and but every... Also, but also... Because you were the ideal reader. Yeah, I was the ideal reader, but let us mention the, the age question. That, that book seems to me to have a, a kind of a tremulous, crystallized music that the world has never seen before. I don't think anyone's written a novel from that vantage. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thrilling voice and um, a, a very beautiful voice. Uh, I've been trying to get him to come here and talk about it, so maybe you can weigh in on okay, my I'll, side. I'll have a word, but I'll sort it out. <laughs> when you left your wife to go with the woman that this book is dedicated to, Right? Mm -hmm. The person who you sought out as a sounding board, as a heartfelt, confident. Confident, yes. Your father. Yeah. Um, <coughs> he, uh, 
he performed, he, and he, you know, he didn't need it. He was 70, um, and he didn't need uh, more disruption. <laughs> also, I was the third of his children, of his three children, to, to fail in marriage, yeah. as he had failed. Um, but he, he completely accepted me in my new reality, and, and was, was the person I could talk to most, with most ease about the most painful things. Um, there was a kind of symmetry involved in that, you know, he'd done it to me. What I felt, you know, mostly terrible about was m my children, sure. uh, my boys, and uh, and he could, he could, he he saw me through. He he completed his fatherly duty and, and and very much helped me through that. Is this in any way a catharsis for you? I tell me what it does to be able to put this down and to talk about this. I mean, you. You are one who is in touch with your feelings. Well, it, it would seem so. Um, my, my metabolism completely changed when I, while I was writing that book. I thought it had changed for good, and I was just getting older. It was just another <laughs> ledge, you know. Meaning what? That well, you, you slowed up in terms of the way you... I, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. Um, and and it, it wasn't unpleasant. In fact, uh, some of the most you know, delicious lions I'd ever had in my life but I'd get up at noon thinking I could do with two or three more hours of this. Um, and I thought, boy, you know, you really are slowing down. And I wasn't reluctant to get to work, but it was just emotional exhaustion. And as soon as you finished this, I was back to normal. Back to normal, as if the unconscious mind had suddenly been plugged in again. Because I didn't need my unconscious mind to write that. I could do it all with the conscious mind. It's not like a novel. And I thought I... I thought I couldn't possibly write a novel in this emotional state. You know, you, you've got to be, you've got to have a bit of ice in you when you're writing a novel. Okay, but did, did writing this hmm. force you to come to grips with emotion, with feelings that you, you know, that you knew were there but you couldn't define them? I know, does the art of writing, the act of writing bring forth the act of defining? It was, it was an orgy of uh, uh, lugubriousness for me. I mean, <laughs> totally lachrymose. Um, Crying all the time. It was sort of limp with emotion um, because writing is also remembering. And yeah. they, they, you know, the, and it's like a muscle. The more you remember, the better your memory gets. But, but, and when you're writing, you have to put it down exactly as you felt it and as you imagined it. And um, that is cathartic that works out the grief. Discovering that you have a child that you didn't know about. That's, well, I, I did know about her. Oh, but you knew about it, but not in the, be not in the beginning. I, I knew of her existence. Uh, From when, the time she was pregnant? No, no, when she was two. Okay. Uh, the mother showed me a photograph. Right. Uh, but in terms of coming to the daughter? I didn't get to know her until she was 19 and already at Oxford. And as Salman Rushdie said, he said, oh, that's quite an interesting way of doing it. He said, you, you skip the nappy, the diaper stage and go straight to mortarboards and, and scholars' gowns. Uh, and she was a, you know, a, 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 a completely grown-up girl. Um, I mean, is this meaningful to you, or is this just I don't know, it's, a, an it's, event that took place? No, it's, no, it's tremendously meaningful for me. And, uh, In what way? Well, <clears throat> something very strange happened when... Uh, when Delilah, her name, when this became public, and there was a lot of in the press. And then on the Sunday, there was a more thoughtful piece by a novelist, Maureen Freely, who said that actually, if you look back at my novels, you can see that from this point on... Exactly. Yeah. You've been writing about... Lost children. Lost children. Vulnerable children. Misattributed children. Um, and you could see it when you thought about it. Oh, I, I jumped out of my boots. You know, it, it, I felt busted. I thought... She's really seen the main you know, I wasn't aware of it myself. Um, although it was sharply consoling at the same time because it meant I had been with Delilah in spirit uh, in the most intense way possible, you know, while writing. Um, but that was a shock, and that was one of the reasons why it felt like an in a good time to write this book because my, you know, my fictional wellsprings had been yeah. exposed. Um, you, you pretty much, why well, call it experience? Why? Yeah. Uh, well, experience, 
is what we all have in common, uh, but it's also the opposite of innocence, as Blake knew. Uh, and it's, the book is about um, the loss of innocence and the necessary and tragic and re to be regretted transfer from innocence to experience. <laughs> there is in the beginning letters from school you say, by the way, Jane, I did Lawrence as the rain bore in for a level, for a level, so I feel qualified to say why he's no good. I still, I shall read the others before the interview, and I fancy War and Peace, and at that Arch Hobbacopin's suggestion, Daniel Duranda, more lightning opinions. Ezra Pound, trendy little ponce, odd and good, but I feel he must be an awful old crap. <laughs> I know. Hopkins, great fun to read, but doesn't stand up to analysis. Well, yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> Dunn, very splendid. Marvell, splendid. Keats, all right when he's not saying I'm a poet. <laughs> Got that? I know. These are, <laughs> what can we, we say to, about the young uh, we Mr. To Amos saying this? I was 17. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's my point. <laughs> that's not my current uh, attitude. <laughs> but the, the hubris or the something to sort of suggest I'm passing judgment here. Oh, desperately insecure <laughs> arrogance. Uh, uh, you must be, you must be, feel good about this is something you had to write, even to get on with your life, probably. Yeah, yeah, I did. And, I, and, and it stood in the way, I mean, probably stood in the, in the way of whatever the other work that you want to go to. It did feel very necessary, but, it, but the main the main desire behind it was to commemorate my father and to, you know, I was uniquely well placed to see what writing was, how, how the life bled into the work and how the work affected the life. I saw it all my childhood. I saw it when my father was married to Elizabeth Jane Howard, right. the son of, you know, I was the child in the house with these two warring writers. Um, and I, I felt, it felt pro bono to, to tell everyone what, what that was like. Okay. Did you write it because you felt uniquely able to define, I mean, there are other things about your life beyond the relationship with your father, but you felt uniquely able to define your father because of what you knew and seen and shared? Or, or did you write it out of your own need to explore this relationship? I guess both. Um, You know, it hasn't happened before. The two writers are stacked, one on top of each other like that. Um, and I thought that I could, I could tell everyone, um, explain the geography of a writer's mind and how it actually works and how, how experience does go into fiction and how it is transformed along the way. Um, I was just awfully well placed. I have a lucky life. Without, with, with your normal powers of candor, uh, compare yourself with your father. Um, as, as literary beings, um, I'd say we were pretty equivalent, actually. And if our dates of birth had been transposed, I might have written his corpus and he might have written mine. The big difference between us is that he was a poet. poet and you were a novelist. You know, a, a, a poet, he was a poet and a novelist, right. which m meant he could sort of let off steam from the novels in his poems. Um, but you've been a poet editor in your life before. I have. And I did write a couple of poems in my youth. Uh, and he used to sneer at me for not being a poet. Um, that was the one. As if what? Well, he'd, he'd say, I, I don't. You know, Where's your first book of poems? He would say, I don't seem to see your first book of poems. Uh, but my poetic impulses such as they are go into my prose and that's the difference between us. Experience a memoir Martin Amos, his father Kingsley Amos. Um, congratulations. Thanks very much, Charlie. We'll be right back. Stay with us. <laughs>